Amen. So we're in Matthew chapter number 13, beginning in verse 44. Jesus is going to speak a parable. A uh, parable, as we've already studied, and we've said numerous times, but I'll just reemphasize it. Parable is an earthly story. Jesus tells just the everyday earthly story, but this earthly story has a deeper meaning. It has a spiritual truth uh, or a heavenly meaning, if you will. Now, notice the words of, of Jesus. He says this, and again. So Jesus' teaching says, and again, he says this, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he, he hideth it, and for joy, therefore, he goeth and he sells all that he has, and he goes and he buys that field. He doesn't stop there. I believe these parables kind of all kind of fit together. I think there's some, some uh, significance here. He says, and again, notice again, he says, the kingdom of heaven. It's like unto a merchant man who is seeking goodly pearls. And when he had found one pearl of great price or great value, he went, notice, again, notice the wording here, he sold all. He sells everything that he has and he buys it. So in this teaching of Jesus, Jesus uses these two stories or parables and he talks about the first man who, who is in a field and maybe this field has little or no, uh, you know, uh, if you will, uh, appeal to it, but he finds a treasure in it and he goes and sells everything that he has to buy it. Says the same thing about a man who's looking for a valuable treasure. You know, maybe he's a, uh, someone who's involved in jewelry and he finds this pearl of great price. We'll come back to that in a moment. I'm reminded of a number of years back, maybe you remember this, but one day a man uh, up in, um, from the New York area was actually in Pennsylvania, my old stomping grounds up there in the Northeast, was in Pennsylvania, he was at some type of a auction, thrift, thrift store auction, and he saw this picture, and the picture was not anything he was interested in, but he said, you know what, I'm interested in that frame. That frame looks pretty nice, and I think I can maybe buy this thing, and I could salvage it, and maybe I can then put something else of better value inside of the frame. So he bought it for, I believe it was $4. He buys this old picture that to most people is worth nothing, and he gave him 4 bucks, and he takes the picture. Takes it home and uh, decides he's going to try to pull off the back and take off the ugly picture on the front of it. And, uh, and when he does, the whole frame begins to fall apart and literally ruins the frame. But when he pulls it apart, he finds a copy of the Declaration of Independence. An original copy in great condition. At first, he's thinking this is too good to be true, and he talks to a friend who talks to another friend. And a long story short, basically, they take it all the way through, and what they realize is that this is one of the original copies, the original copy of the Declaration of Independence. He later sold that Declaration of Independence for $2.4 million. Whew, I don't know about you, but... Four bucks, 2.4 million, that's a good trade-off. But he did it by accident. There was another woman who was a kind of a retired truck driver, and she was in California. She go, was in California, and she, again, walks into a thrift shop, and while she's in there, she thought, I'm going to buy a gift for my friend. She's kind of gloomy. She's kind of down. And her idea was, I'll buy her some kind of gift. I'll find something. And she was actually going to go to her friend's house to cheer up her friend. Long story short, she looks over in the quarter, uh, corner, and she sees this most hideous, ugliest picture she can find. And she literally laughs at it. It was a painting. And she laughs at it. And she thinks, that is the ugliest thing I have ever seen in my life. That will cheer up my friend. I can cheer her up with that. So she goes and she picks it up and it says $8. And she said, this $8 for this piece? She says, I will not. And she kind of started bartering. She says, I will not pay $8. And she talked the owner of the thrift shop down to $5. So she gave him $5. She took the picture and uh, the painting, and she was going to take it to a friend. And it was a more of what you consider a modern art. And it was all it was was a bunch of squiggly lines. And she took it to her friend's house, and the idea was that they were going to hang it on the wall, and they're going to throw darts at it. 
This is a true story. The woman's name was Terry. And so Terry says, well, we can throw darts. That'll be fun. Well, when they were getting ready to do this, one of the friends uh, that was there that was hanging out with them, and this was a way to cheer her up, said, you know what? You might not want to do that because I'm dating a guy who's kind of, in, he, he does painting. And I think that might be a, a valuable piece. They said, this thing, this, all this, they're like, no, it's, it's interpretive art. It's valuable. Don't do anything to it. She says, okay, whatever. Whatever, okay. So they take the painting from one person to the next person, the next person. The long story short, the woman who paid $5 for something that they were going to throw darts at sold for over $4 million. Whoa, what a good day. What a good day. by accident. I don't know about you, but I've never done anything that good by accident. <laughs> now, in this story that Jesus is telling, this is something that someone does intentionally. It wasn't something that happened by accident. In this story, let's just look at the earthly story for a moment. There's a man. And let's put ourselves in this man's shoes. Maybe one day there's a piece of land. It's for sale and and honestly, maybe he's going after thinking, well, maybe I can purchase this land and maybe I can get a good deal. And it must not be very appealing because no one else is buying it. And we can't read too much into it, but this we know that it's probably not the most appealing land. But this man decides for some reason he's on this property. And while he's on this property, it's a good day for him. Because while he's on the property, he sees that there is a treasure and he knows that this treasure is worth a lot. This is very valuable. So the man, with some wisdom, he says, man, whoever buys the field gets the treasure. And so uh, he decides, I'm going to buy this field. But here's the catch. He has to sell everything that he has. He literally has to sell everything. And the Bible says with joy. With joy. Why? Because he knows that if I sell everything I have and if I can afford to buy that land, then I will get the treasure that's in the field. And so the man sacrifices. The man then, the Bible says, goes and he leaves. And the story that Jesus tells, he goes, he leaves, and he sells everything he has. And let's put it in today's terms. He goes home and he sells his car. And his neighbor's saying, why are you selling your car? You're going to have to walk. You know, now we're putting it in today's terms, okay? He sells his car, puts it up, sells it. Puts it on Craigslist, sold, you know? The neighbor's thinking, what are you doing? Well, they're thinking, well, he's going to ride his bike. No, he sells his bike. He sells the kids' tricycles. He sells the toys. He, he sells little, you know, his little girl's trampoline. I mean, he's selling it all. The little kiddie pool. I mean, he has a yard sale. And then after that, he goes out and he sells his house. He sells his property. He literally sells everything. I mean, let's put this in perspective. He gives it all up. He sells it all. He gets rid of everything. And I'm sure his wife is saying, why did you empty the wardrobe? What about, not those shoes, please, not those shoes. Just trust me, trust me, honey. It's going to be worth it. I'll buy you a hundred pairs of shoes. She's like, take them, you know. <laughs> sells it all. The only thing they have is the clothes on their back and that's it. By the way, don't you think that the rest of the world, don't you think that the neighbors, and don't you think that the mother-in-law and the father-in-law of this guy thought, our daughter Mary, now I don't know if there's Mary, but I'm just putting it into our, our, our modern day world of how we live. We would think that guy is crazy. He's selling everything for that piece of land and there's not even anything on it. There's no house. He just bought a field. Bought a field that's full of cactus and thorns and rattlesnakes and rocks and more rocks. What a fool. But with joy, he sells everything. And he buys that field because in that field is a valuable treasure. Again, Jesus teaches again. 
And he says there was a merchant man, a man who was looking for a pearl of great price. And when he goes out and when he finds the one that he knows is of great value, he sells everything he has. He does the same thing. He sells everything he has, gives up everything to buy that one pearl of great price. Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So what does that mean? What is the interpretation? What is Jesus teaching? And I think many of us kind of get the picture. We get the point here. Jesus is that merchant. Jesus is the man. He is the man who, who went out and purchased the field. It's interesting because as you study the scripture, you look through scripture, you realize that what Jesus is saying, and, and this blows my mind, but what Jesus is teaching when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field, like the pearl of great price, well, you don't really comprehend this, but he is speaking about you and I that I am that treasure, that you are that treasure, that he, he, he saw this treasure in the field. If you look across the page in, in the same chapter, Matthew 13, but verse 38, it's really simple. The Bible says this, in this teaching earlier, Jesus said that the field is the world, that the field is the world. So you understand what Jesus is saying is that the field is, is, the, is the world and the treasure that he saw is you and I. How awesome is that? That the pearl of great price or great value is you. And Jesus, he went and purchased the field. He purchased the field, which is the world. Christ saw the treasure. He saw the souls of men and women that would trust in him. He saw the boys and girls that would put their faith and trust and humble themselves and call upon him. He saw, whether we realize this or not, he saw the treasure of the prostitutes and the alcoholics and the drug addicts. He saw the treasure of you and he saw the treasure of me in that field. And the Bible says that he sold everything that he had. Jesus literally gave everything. He gave up heaven. He left heaven. He took off his royal crown. Think about this, humbled himself. The Bible says he humbled himself and became a man. He made himself lower than the angels. He took off his royal crown. He left his father in heaven, he left heaven, came to earth, and lived as a man. But not only that, but when we think about what he went through, what he did on the cross, that when the Bible says that the man gave up everything, we see that Jesus is the man that he's speaking about, and Jesus literally did. He gave his blood. He gave his life. The Bible tells us that the church, that he purchased the church, that's the body of Christ, with his blood. He gave everything. If you will, he sold everything that he had. By the way, I believe it's so biblical because the Bible says that we've been ransomed. The Bible says that he ransomed, that there's one mediator in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And it says who was a, he was a ransom for all. He bought us back. He purchased us. He paid for us. The Bible says that we were redeemed. It means to be bought back. That we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Reminds me of a little story. Some of you may have heard of this story about a little boy. A little boy went to the store one day and he purchased a little boat, a little sailboat. He went and he purchased that boat and he took and went home and he took a lot of time, hours and hours, and he began to piece together this beautiful little sailboat. So he puts the sailboat together and could not wait till the day that he could take it out 
and take it down to the little creek by his house and to put it in the creek and to watch it sail. And so he would do that. He would take it out and he'd say, oh, look, at, look how beautiful it is. I made this with my own hands. And he couldn't wait. And he put it into water and it actually flowed and it would float and it was going down the creek and he enjoyed it. And he took it back home and he went back to his parents. He said, Mom and Dad, it floated. It was so beautiful. I, it's so awesome. It was wonderful. And he went back the next day and for a period of time, he would do this. One day he took it out. and It was a kind of a stormy day, a rainy day. And he put it into the, to the creek, but the creek, the water's running faster and faster and flowing faster and faster. And you know what happened? He lost his sailboat. He came home so upset and broken and went home and he was crying and went to his parents and he said, oh, my sailboat, it's gone. I've lost it. It's gone. Some days went by and he was walking down the street and as he was walking down the street, he saw in this little second hand shop, like a little kind of a pawn shop, thrift shop, he looks in and he sees his boat in there. He says, that's my boat. That's the boat I made. I know it. I made that boat. I created that boat. I put that boat together. That's my boat. So he went in to the shop owner. He said, that's my boat. The man said, well, I'm sorry. He says, but, but I own it now. He says, it's mine. And if you want that boat, you're going to have to pay for it. That boat costs $10. Well, to a young boy, $10 was a lot. So he went home. He went back home and he took out his piggy bank and he broke the piggy bank. He pulled the money out of that. He went to his parents and said, what would, can I have my allowance? Can I have my allowance, please? They gave him his allowance. He went through the cushions of the couch like all of us do. Went through the old car and reached underneath and pulled out. And he pulled out and he took all of his change and he counted it all and he had just enough, $10. And he walked in to that store owner and he gave him all that he had, all $10. And he bought that boat. And he took that boat and he was so excited to have it back. And he said that, he said this, you are twice mine. You were mine when I created you, and you were lost, and now I bought you. By the way, can I say this? You and I have been twice bought. God created us. He loved us and created us and made us and formed us. And you are special and you are unique. And God created you. He has a purpose and a plan for you. But let's be honest. There was a time when we were spiritually away from God, where we were lost. Come on now. But he bought us back. He purchased us with his blood. How awesome is that? The field is the world, the Bible says. The Bible tells us that this man sells everything that he has. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he became poor so that we could become rich. Philippians 2 says that he became, that he made himself of no reputation so that we could become rich. A child of God. The Bible says that he purchased this field. The field is the world. I like what the Bible says in John 3, 16. If you know it, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his, his son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He bought the field. He purchased the world with his blood so that all who will call upon him can have eternal life. Second Peter three, nine says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us word. Listen to these words. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He purchased the field. He bought that field. Because he saw the treasure in the field. And the treasure is those who call upon him and accept him as Lord and Savior. There was once a boy named Stephen. His family relocated and they moved to a new town. And they actually moved right in and around Valentine's Day. And so the boy 
was so excited about Valentine's Day. He had 35 kids in his class. And so Stephen wanted everyone in his class to know how much he cared about him and that he loved him. And so he, with care, sat down and he made 35 Valentine cards. And he wrote a special note on each one and put a little piece of chocolate on each one of the cards and put it all together. And he took a bag and told his mom, I can't wait. To, it's Valentine's Day. I can't wait. Now, mom being mom, she was a little worried. She was concerned because she thought, man, we're brand new. And, you know, my son, he you know, probably won't get a Valentine. She was a little worried. She was a little concerned. But he was excited, couldn't wait to take his Valentine cards to all of his new classmates. So that morning, Valentine's Day, he takes his little bag to school. And she kind of waits. She's anticipating, what's it going to be like when he comes home? And so she sees him coming, and she can hear him. He's mumbling. He's saying something under his breath, and he keeps saying this, not a one. Not a one, not a one. And oh, mom was so heartbroken. Mom, a little tear in her eyes. She's like, he didn't even get one. He didn't even get one Valentine card. And she keeps hearing him say, not a one, not a one. And her heart's breaking for a little boy. And he comes and as she sees, he gets a little closer. He keeps saying, not a one, not a one. She says, honey, what do you, what do you mean not a one? What do you mean, Stephen? What do you mean not a one? He says, not a one, mommy. Not a one. I didn't forget one of them. I gave every single one of them. All 35 got one. They all know how much I love them. You know, isn't that the way our Savior is? See, that boy had an unselfish love that it wasn't about him, if you will, but it was about his classmates. Aren't you thankful for our Savior that was willing to sell everything, to give his life, to shed his blood, to purchase the field? Because you and I are the treasure. You and I are that pearl of great price. Aren't you thankful for your Savior this morning? Aren't you thankful that he was willing to sell everything to purchase that field? Now, we ought to leave here rejoicing, knowing that we are the treasure in the field. Amen? We ought to leave here rejoicing that we are the pearl of great price. Give me two or three minutes for an application. I believe there's an application here. That field probably did not look very valuable that field probably was not very appealing. By the way, let me remind you of something. We are sinners, and most people would not be willing to do what Christ did for us, but he saw the treasure in us. Amen? Aren't you thankful for that? You know, he loved us when we were unlovely. He did. He died for us when we were unlovely. But an application, I think, could be something like this. Is that many people only saw the field, but they didn't see the treasure. You know, I think there's an application here because Jesus, he saw the treasure in the field. And of course, in the parable, you and I, that, that, was, that we were the treasure, we're that pearl. And the idea is this, is that I believe we can maybe draw an application in this sense is that Jesus saw the relationship that we could have with the Father, the relationship that we could have with Him. And so He overlooked the field, the field that was filled with rocks. He did not get distracted with the rocks, the rattlesnakes, the cactus and the thorns and the thistles, because He kept His eyes on the treasure. In a very simple way, I think sometimes in life, what we can do in our relationships is that sometimes what we do is we get our eyes off of the treasure. We get our eyes off of that thing, that beautiful thing about a person, and we see the field. Because the fact of the matter is, you want to know something? We all have a field. Come on now. We all can be prickly sometimes. 
I think my wife doesn't mind me saying this. I joke about it. But sometimes I, I can be prickly. And I, you know, and now that we've moved to Arizona, there's times maybe, you know, sometimes my wife can be a little moody, you know? I mean, it's tough when she's living with perfection. I mean, it just makes it really hard. <laughs> you weren't supposed to laugh that hard. <laughs> See if you're awake. So, you know, when you're living with perfection, it kind of, you know, you feel, anyway, no. But I'll joke with her and I'll say, honey, you know what? You're my prickly pear cactus, but you have such beautiful blooms. <laughs> you know what? I did not know that cactuses had pretty flowers. And you know what? If you don't look carefully, you overlook the beautiful blooms and the pretty flowers. I did not know that. And I'll be honest, we first moved here, I said, oh, those cactuses, they're ugly. And then all of a sudden, this time of year, you see them open up, and they are beautiful. You know, even at the top of those big, with a Sororo cactus, when you look at the top of them, they have a beautiful flower that comes up. They're pretty. They're beautiful. And even though they're prickly, and even though, they, you know, we, that's what we see, the thorns that stick out of many of these things. But the fact of the matter is, they still have a treasure. Even the bees know that. The hummingbirds know that. You know, in our relationships, we often get caught up with and we see the field. Right? In our marriage, we can see the field. Parents, raising kids, sometimes we see the field and we forget about the treasure. Hey, kids, sometimes... You forget that your, you know your parents have a field, right? They're constantly telling you what to do. Do this, do that. Help with this, help with that. And they, we, you know, and you see the parents feel. But here's the thing that all of us, there's a treasure in us. Amen? Husbands and wives, there better be a treasure. There better be a reason why you married that person. Come on now. But you know what we do? We get our eyes off the treasure. And many times we see the field don't we? We see the little quirks or the things that irritate us, that bother us, and we get our eyes off that treasure. Happens in our relationships, friendships, happens at home, happens in the marriage, happens with parents and kids, sometimes at work, whatever it may be. But the fact of the matter is many a times we get our eyes off the treasure, we see the field. And we get distracted by the field, the rocks and the thistles and the thorns. And, well, I got poked today. You know, or I got, you know, boy, I got a thorn. But let's, in our relationships, let's not get distracted by the field. And let's be like Christ. And let's make sure we keep our eyes on the treasure. Amen? That's what Jesus did. Jesus kept his eyes on the treasure. And the Bible says with joy, with joy, he purchased the, the field because he knew that the treasure that was in that field was valuable. The Bible says this, interesting, with joy, in Hebrews, with joy, Jesus endured the cross. With joy, he went to the cross. Why? Why does Hebrews say with joy he endured the cross? I think we find the answer here in Matthew. Just like that man who sold everything he had, he said, you know what? I'm going to sell all that I have, but the treasure will be worth it. When Jesus was on his way to the cross, the Bible says with joy he went to the cross. He endured the cross. Why? because he realized that the treasure would be far more valuable. That you and I would have the privilege to spend eternity with him in heaven. Whew, how awesome is that? Where we will honor him and glorify him and worship him and praise him for all eternity. And Jesus said, it's worth it. I will sell everything because the treasure is worth it. That pearl of great price. Jesus purchased the field, the world. Now this blows my mind and I'm done. Because he mentions the pearl 
What I believe he is truly saying and truly trying to drive home is this, is that if you were the only one, because he says pearl singular, if you were the only one, he would have done it all just for you. Does that not blow you away? He would have done it just for me. That he was willing to give it all. When he says the pearl of great price, that one of great value, that one pearl means this, that if it was just you, he would have done it. How awesome of a savior we have. That yes, he purchased the field. And yes, there was that great treasure. But he says, you know something? If you were the only one, I would do it just for you. May we leave here this morning grateful and thankful that our Lord was willing to sell all that he had, that he's willing to give himself completely and fully for each one of us. And all God's people said this morning, amen. And let's keep our eyes on the treasure because everyone has a field. But keep your eye on the treasure in our relationships. Let's stand together and have a word of prayer this morning. Let's pray.